Uh, good morning, good afternoon to to all. From, from, okay, I'm going to okay. I'm restarting. Just in, inviting some people, other people. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure to um, to meet you today and to have this uh, third session uh, with Alticia, uh, a webinar proposed by IFCO uh, uh, regarding combining online and face-to-face -face learning for optimal learner engagement with Veronique Shares and Marvin Schulz. So thank you very much for your presence and for the, the webinar you're going to give in the presentation. Uh, um, I let you go and um, and um, we are going to learn a lot today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Luke, for the introduction. Uh, Viru, are you, are you going to? Yep, perfect. Uh, I am, presentation. Yep. <laughs> so um, a very good morning or afternoon, wherever you are based to everyone who already entered. And um, I think some of um, some people will enter um, in a few seconds even more. My name is Marvin Schulz. I'm a project developer um, at Alticia for the German, Austrian and Swiss market um, based in Germany, basically at the moment. And together with my colleague Veronique, um, we will present you how Alticia can support you with blended learning approaches in teaching languages. So uh, before giving the word to Veronique, I would like um, to yeah, speak a little bit um, about Alticia, um, just to let you know who we are. Yep, perfect for the slide. Thank you. So Alticia is a company established in 2005 and it is um, established as a spin-off of the Catholic University of Leuven, or um, leuven la Neuf. And, and since then we have developed different tools, among others a platform for language e-learning. And right now at this stage today we can offer variable solutions and our platform is available in 36 interface languages, which is quite a lot. And we provide courses for 25 languages one can learn on the platform, but mainly European languages. But also we do have special specializations, for instance, um, for Canadian French and uh, the distinction between British and American English. Apparently they are, uh, you all know. And we do provide a language assessment test for um, approximately 29. No, it's exactly 29 languages at the moment. And as you can see on this slide, we are a company present in 14 countries um, covering five continents um, and working currently with approximately um, slightly more than 600 institutions and organizations, mainly focused on business to business and business to academics. So we are working quite a lot um, in the academic environment. That's also why we are here today and we're really Proud to have this academic background and um, be able to provide guidance and solutions, especially also in the academic field. Um, and what we really like about, or what I especially really like about working with, with and for Alticia is that we do live our interculturality and our multilingualism. Our team is composed of people uh, from all over the world um, who all all of us have a passion for languages and we all speak several languages so we actually live what we do what we say what we offer and that's um quite quite nice um quite interesting to have actually so um now i would like to leave the floor to veronique um to do a deep dive into today's topic and um yeah nevertheless in the end of the presentation, I would like to open the discussion. Um, so you can write your questions also during the presentation in the chat. Um, I would probably pick them up after the presentation. Um, I think it's um, the, the better flow at the moment. And um, feel free to bring in your questions, everything you have in mind. You come, come across also your examples if you want to share anything. And then we can make the sessions after the present presentation more vivid. So thank you very much. And uh, Veronique, c'est à toi. Thank you very much, Luric, and also Marvin uh, for this uh, lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to start uh, by apologizing for my terribly nasal voice today. It seems European win winter got the best of me. Uh, so I'll try and uh, soldier through this um, without breathing, uh, apparently. Um, so um, thank you for bearing with me uh, and my terrible voice today. So let's dive into the topic. Um, 
as we were saying, so today we'll be focusing on skills and various activities and how we can distribute them over a blended learning mode. So you might have followed the first two um, webinars. It's a good thing, but it is not compulsory. So we will just be starting maybe by putting some common ground uh, just for, so that everybody's on the same page um, and then we can get started into the specifics. So just to redefine blended learning, um, the blended learning is, of course, a teaching or learning approach which combines two modalities, a synchronous and an asynchronous um, modality. So we have an asynchronous modality. It's a teacher led approach, either in a physical classroom, brick and mortar, or it can also be video conferencing. The idea is really to have something that is teacher led where we are exchanging in real time, whether it's actually physically face to face or not. That is OK. Uh, and then we combine this with an asynchronous mode, which is usually a platform learning or learning on an LMS uh, autonomously. That's the most important bit. Uh, and the learners are working on their own. There's no teacher, trainer, professor, lecturer, whatever, breathing down their neck, getting them to work. They're really autonomous. They, um, it's, it's really a self-led study uh, approach. So we combine both of these. Um, modalities into a blended learning approach. And the idea is really to have a course that is a coherent whole. That is something uh, where we find the right balance, where both of uh, our modalities don't just coexist somewhere in parallel without ever touching, but it's actually really two pieces of a puzzle. And the course in itself is only whole when, uh, when we get both our modalities correct. So these two modalities need to be connected. They need to be linked. That is, uh, if you follow the first two webinars, it's something I keep insisting on this connection, this link between our two, uh, our two modalities to really um, make a point that it is important to also do the distance learning, the, the autonomous self-study uh, part of the, of the course. Um, otherwise, we uh, hear things such as, but yeah, but blended learning doesn't work because the learners never do the online activities. There is, of course, a risk. We need to engage them more to do this autonomous work, because if they don't see the point, they will not do it. At least that is clearly what my students were like usually. But if you really see them, make them see the sense, the point of the activity, and that the class is, the course is only coherent, it's only whole if you do both uh, those part, both parts, if they're connected, then usually they have a more incentive. It's not a guarantee for them to do the online work, but at least they have more incentive and they see the point of actually doing it. Um, and then, of course, the whole um, course will be built around it's a language course usually so if it's in, in line with the pedagogical objectives we will combine it with collaborative activities lots of feedback and comments but also blended learning will give us this flexibility of deciding what we want to do in either modality really so either in the face-to-face -face synchronous uh, part of the course or in the autonomous asynchronous part of the course um, and so today I want to focus on the different skills and competences that we uh, cover in foreign language learning and teaching. Um, very briefly, um, just to define it quickly, the difference between skills and competences, uh, you have it on the screen here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so you see um, the knowledge and the know-how and the interpersonal skills that a person possesses. And that person's learning skills, these are the competence, competences. And then we have the skills, which are, of course, the traditional communication activities, such as oral comprehension, written comprehension. Uh, oh, I have oral comprehension twice, actually, it's oral production, no, oral production and written production as well. Um, and then, of course, we have these skills um, or sub skills, we rather, or like subsets of these skills that are grammar and vocabulary that are often included as part of our courses, either within communicative tasks or really on their own. So that really depends on your own approach and, and how you see things on, on grammar and vocabulary. I'm not taking a stance here today, though I do think that teaching grammar is quite important. It's an important part of, of language learning. And of course, we have the, the competences that are also connected to that. That is, of course, the plurilingual, multilingual competence, learning skills, study skills, knowing how to learn, and then these uh, mediation skills, which come uh, to be an, impo an important part of, of course, oral production, interaction as well. So these we see um, always are linked and connected to our learning process. So when we subdivide our different skills, usually we have receptive or, and productive skills. 
And traditionally, we'd say maybe um, we tend to say, OK, receptive skills are very good for online learning because, well, it's receptive, so we don't need to produce. And then we can focus on productive skills in class and the face to face approach of a blended learning course. Um, which is, of course, an approach. Again, it needs to be in line with your course objectives. So this is just a, a general, like a rule of thumb, I'd rather say. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way, obviously. You can work productively online, and we're going to chat about that just in just a minute. Um, maybe this is actually also a point for you, a moment for you, where you could share in the chat um, yourself. Maybe are there activities that seem to be more difficult for you to set up online, maybe grammar, vocabulary, oral comprehension, oral production, written comprehension, written production. Which 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 activities, which kind of skills, sub skills do you like working on online or not? Uh, maybe that is a good moment for you to uh, to share your opinion as well in the chat. Um, and then maybe while you type this in, we can already get started. And I'm diving straight into it uh, with uh, grammar, actually. Um, as our first, as I said, subskill rather. Um, grammar is, of course, one of these. Uh, I was discussing it earlier, so it, it's usually resulting from a communicative task. Communicative task. It's integrated in the content or, or context, or it's really taught in itself um, as 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 grammar itself. But usually, it's connected to other things. Um, so, of course, grammar can be taught in either way. It can be taught asynchronously, which is what many people favor, or synchronously as well. Some teachers just like teaching grammar, including myself, actually. I just like teaching grammar, and I like to do it synchronously, but also asynchronously. And it's quite easy because there's obviously a lot of resources you can find online, whether you're working with a platform such as Altissia or any other um, resources. Obviously, that depends on the languages you're teaching. If you're lucky enough to be teaching English, you'll find a lot of online resources, even interactive ones you can just easily include. Others you might have to create in other languages. So that is, uh, of course, diff different. But um, there is plenty of resources you can find for grammar online. And then you can either work, for example, in a way where the discovery of the structure can either happen in class synchronously and then uh, it's being you built on that in the um, asynchronous Faced, uh, in the online learning, or you do the opposite and you're using kind of a flipped classroom approach where learners autonomously observe and isolate the structure, deduce the rules, um, read grammar files, uh, flashcards, maybe they can watch explanatory videos or something, do some first little exercise for anchoring, and then we put it into form really in class and face to face and then uh, we can put it into communicative practice as well and deepen understanding go maybe see some exceptions any anything that might not be clear from um, the online learning and, and go into this so we really have both approaches here we can use uh, for, for grammar of course online the good thing is you can find also a lot of gamified exercises um, little grammar I don't like using the word drill but it's it's it's, it's frequently it's 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 hidden um, or drills in disguise rather uh, in these games, but these can be very fun. And then you can do speed games or little um, things about like really to fixate grammar and to to focus on that. Then um, let's talk about our next skill. Vocabulary, again, it's again the subskill rather subset of the other communicative skills. Um, again, usually it's seen in context, not isolated. So it's also a good way to um, introduce synchronously, maybe in, in resources you're using in class. And then how about working it then asynchronously online to go more in depth, um, to really um, maybe um, work on that, uh, like mobilize that uh, that vocabulary that was seen and really study it, learn it to in, in order to anchor it. Again, obviously, that would be simple and current everyday words for beginners, and then we go into more complex and more specialized uh, registers as well um, as the level advances. Then learners, if they're working asynchronously, they can work on creating glossaries um, or maybe uh, flashcards or something where they have their own uh, resources. That can either be done in any kind of resource you have, or they do it with an old, good, good old notepad and pen for example, and then they can create their own little exercises. We can also uh, fixate this again with exercises online or tasks. And then, or then we can work it um, 
uh, synchronously then build on that again. Again, this idea of really connecting our two parts of the of the of the course, build on what was seen online, and really do revision activities at the start of a class. Hello, it can that's... be a quiz, it can be a game, it can be a communicative practice. Um, uh, no, so it can be anything. I see there's people coming in. Might I just ask you to switch off your microphones, please? Okay. Good. All right. That is about vocabulary. Let's move on to um, comprehension exercises. All in written comprehension. I always like, but that is just a personal preference. Um, again, uh, it's a good task to do asynchronously because it's comprehension. So, per definition, our learners will all be working at different speeds. They'll all be using their own speed, which can be kind of a hassle. Um, maybe if you're doing this um, in class, people are reading a text. Um, or listening to an audio or video and some people are done after the first round others need a second a third round um, which might frustrate those learners that are already done um, they might get bored they start chatting um, then the others get frustrated because they're slower they, they maybe feel less competent the task is maybe they're not feeling that competent with the task they're not feeling that comfortable they're also seeing that others have an easier time with it so it, it's not good for them. And then they have noise as well, background noise, so they get frust even more frustrated. So it's a circle of frustration. Um, and it's really, in the end, the serpent biting its own tail, really. Uh, and then trying to get some focus and order back into the class can be a bit of a hassle, um, which is why I always like putting these comprehension tasks online, as long as it's an exercise. It's just um, um um, formative activity where learners will be just there to work at their own pace. The advantage of having them work online is they can listen to the audio as many times as they need to understand the text or to answer the question. If they're done after one, they were done after one. Uh, if they need a third time, it's perfectly fine as well. And they, they can really focus on their own pace, their own needs, their own um, maybe look up vocabulary elements um, or um, or really take their time to 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 do the task correctly. Then, of course, um, when we're doing this online, there is a lot of resources. Again, whether you're using a platform, uh, a platform like Altissia, which is built around um, these kind of discovery documents, which is uh, usually introductory videos where you have an audio text, or for example, news videos as well, which you can find on the platform. But it can be anything really. Um, uh, depending on the resources you have at your disposal to to do this. So you can use didacticize documents at lower levels, authentic documents, as I was mentioning earlier, um, news videos, for example, from advanced levels, and then really focus on first detailed and uh, first general and detailed comprehension, and then maybe something more vocabulary oriented. Um, and then again, we can connect this whole thing with what is then uh, in, in the next class, for example, so that they don't get the impression that this exercise online was done for nothing or just for, you know, for fun, but rather that it had, there's, there's a point to it. So we connect it with the next class session where we have, um, where we use what was seen in those resources. We make connections. Um, we can either basis as presentations, discussions, summaries, any kind of communicative skills we can connect to what was read or what was um, heard in the in the audio as well. Uh, and again, we have this option of, you know, reusing uh, what was learned in the productions. Again, making flashcards of the vocabulary or make a, sh a short summary or something, which again, use mobilize these communicative skills then afterwards. <laughs> I'm just going to switch off my mic one second to not cough into. All right, I'm sorry about that. Let's move on to, um, oh yeah, what I haven't mentioned here is of course, then we can also introduce um, in class um, before we get to the autonomous work. It's of course important to prepare these kind of tasks, especially if you have learners that are not used to language learning. You have novice learners, learners that are learning their first foreign language, depending on really where you are or who your students are as well. They might not be familiar with strategies and really knowing how to learn. So it's very important to prepare them for these tasks. If you're just 
you know, when we're just throwing our learners in at the deep end uh, and expect them to swim, it's not always an option. I, I, I come back to this in um, in the summary uh, of the of the session as well at the end. Just um, really, we need to kind of guide them into it, especially if they're like early students, uh, first year students, for example. Um, let's talk about oral production. That, of course, and that is usually what I like uh, about blended learning is that um, it helps us get more time to do these kind of tasks uh, because we can put receptive tasks into the online part. And then I personally favor um, oral production or interaction usually in the synchronous part in class and face to face. Uh, that is the beauty of it, because then we can really we have the, the class, we have the socio uh, socio emotional bond we can build as well on. We can get peer feedback, we can get teacher feedback, we can learn from one another. And um, but of course, just technically, um, technology has reached a point where oral production in the online part is perfectly doable is perfectly realizable but um especially now with uh, depending on the tools you have at your disposal uh, you can do video recording you can voice note recording everybody has a phone usually in their pocket and you can you can do that depending on whether you have sharing platforms it can be just a whatsapp group where you can share so that really depends on so you can still do productive tasks oral productive tasks um online without being face to face but of course it's more fun um, for learners to do it uh, in face-to-face -face class, though it depends again on the learner type as well, because some very conservative learners might not be comfortable. Again, they're, they're more shy, maybe have some performance anxiety, and then in this case, the, the, um, the asynchronous productive activities might be a good option for them because they're just talking to their phones and maybe feeling a bit less observed than through uh, through uh, classroom production, for example. So you might get surprises. So here it's also about finding a balance to accommodate all the learner types and learner needs as well. Uh, oral production then can again be um, spontaneous or it can be uh, prepared as well. Um, like for example, taking a stance or a presentation. Um, then of course, um, what's important afterwards in, in any type is of course to get feedback which once again can either be spontaneous uh, right in class where we can give feedback to the whole class to individual learners or it can also be asynchronous um, depending on um, on the needs or maybe also the type of feedback if it's slightly more delicate we might not want to do that in in, in public either uh, so we have both modes again where we can get in touch with our learners then slightly different case being oral interaction, which is per definition usually spontaneous. Again, here it's usually easier to do this synchronously. Asynchronously is of course possible, where but then again we need two students at least, or maybe uh, some kind of chat or um, any kind of way where um, there's social networks that uh, connect native speakers uh, and language learners of that particular language, um, social network apps, where you can do these kind of interactions. Of course, it's more difficult to follow up on this as a teacher. If it's it's happening online and you need a recording of a conversation or a call between two students or in this, in this, in this network or just a feedback or something, that's more, a bit more difficult. Or then you can also do paired interaction in synchronous Course, which is less spontaneous, it's usually more didacticized, it's a safer setting. Uh, so it depends, it's maybe the safer option for um, beginners and, and intermediate learners. And then we can have role playing debates where they maybe they can prepare slightly, but still be quite spontaneous about it. Again, here we have these also the, the importance of these communicative strategies and um, the learning strategies as well for, for um, spontaneous speech to avoid a breakdown of communication. We need to teach our learners to rephrase, not panic if you can't find a word, for example, um, rephrasing, paraphrasing, starting over, um, just saying, OK, I have I, I didn't understand you. Can you please re please repeat or ask for help and, 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 and all these kind of um, mediation strategies as well we need for um, to avoid this breakdown of communication. So that is very important as well to, again, prepare learners for this um, for in order for these activities to work. There's one thing, of course, doing this in class where you're there to help and mediate with them. But if it's um, asynchronous, um, especially if they're in social networks, they will need this, this safety net of, of these strategies as well. So we're helping them really become also more autonomous in these kind of tasks. 
So really depending on your, your class level, your class needs, your learner needs, um, either solution might be a very good one uh, and, and really help learners evolve and become more autonomous in their language use. Then we have written production. That is also one of these things. Again, as long as it's um, just uh, formative, it's not, not for um, um, evaluation assessment, then um, doing it asynchronously is a good option for those frustration and interrupting um, reasons I was mentioning earlier. It's quite disruptive to have a written production in class. Again, some will be done after five minutes, others maybe a bit extreme. Others will take longer. So again, we have um, we have the option of, of maybe doing it asynchronously. Um, doing this kind of task online, I mean, obviously we can give assignments and they hand them in, send them in via, I don't know, Moodle or any kind of LMS you have or any kind of tools you're using or via email is one way. Or we have also the option of doing more authentic productions online. We could do a reaction to a YouTube video, a Facebook post, post. it can be, a um, feedback on a movie, a summary of something uh, on a forum. They could post a recipe, something, loads of different tasks that have more authentic um, vibes than a purely didacticized task. Um, so this again can give more, you know, you know, seeing the point of actually doing this, uh, this, this, this task. Uh, it's just as a follow up, it's of course more difficult to follow up on what the learners have been producing. So we, we need them to take a screenshot of the reaction and share it with the group and or the teacher, which of course would be a solution then. And then we can do it synchronously, of course, as well. Again, if we need it to be, we can have them write a long assignment or we can be a bit more playful, do something more, more fun, such as writing guesses where someone writes, for example, I don't know, a description of themselves and learners need to guess who has written this one or a true or false where everybody would write, I don't know, three statements about themselves or, or about someone and the class would need to guess uh, if it's true or false. So sm short, the varying length of, 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 of assignments really, where we can get loads of different um, parts of productions as well. Again, feedback can be synchronous, it can be in asynchronous, it can be individual, it can be f uh, collective. It can come from the teacher, but also in this kind of setting, we can also perfectly work in pairs and have peer learning, peer evaluation happening as well, learning from one another. It's also a good way to connect with your fellow learners and then also use it as a mediation um, uh, strategy. Again, we're mobilizing the foreign language as well to express uh, what, what, what was, to evaluate what was, um, produced by the others as well. And then we have the special case of written interaction, which per definition is more of an online, maybe a skill, uh, texting, um, chatting uh, in, a, in an online chat, for example. So these, this is of course easier to do asynchronously. It's um, it's quite recent in the, in the Common European framework when we're seeing about it. Um, so we can have obviously instantaneous and spontaneous written interactions, which can, which can be in pairs. If you're talking one-on-one -on -one with a person, it can be also in groups, maybe if it's a group chat, it can be with learners, it can be with native speakers, it can be free on a given, on a given topic. So there's a lot of things that can uh, happen here. So there's chats and messaging tools that are available. There is um, obviously just starting with uh, WhatsApp or any kind of uh, messaging tool up to specialized uh, peer uh, learning apps, uh, social networks, again, where you can chat with learners. There's some of them that offer um, automatic like correction as well, where you can give feedback on the other learners um, production. So they, they write a sentence and you can say, okay, there's a little typo in there, or you'd better say this like this, and you can correct them actually. Um, again, here, monitoring is often a bit more complicated depending on the tool. There's not always monitoring tools, even in those social networks. Uh, so again, we need to rely on screenshots or reports by learners. Um, and we have these, um, 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 the communicative strategies that are for, for oral production, which of course are kind of um, important here as well to, to rephrase, paraphrase. Maybe they can correct themselves, but they can also need to ask for help or repeat and ask for repetition or, or these kind of elements as well. Okay, so let's just briefly talk about time management. Now we've talked about all these skills. We know what we can do. Uh, th there's a lot we can do online. There's a lot more than we think maybe we can do online also. Um, usually 
what would be the recommendations for autonomous online learning? So the, we've talked about in, in a previous webinar about the breakdown, how, how much time uh, do we consider blended learning? How, how should the, the repetition be? Um, what we recommend usually for autonomous online learning, usually we tend to overdo it and overestimate our learners, thinking, OK, most of them these days are digital natives. Um, they spend hours online on social media. They spend hours online chatting to their friends, playing video games. So they're used to working online. So if we put them like uh, we give them a two hour learning session online, they should be fine. Uh, the thing is, they're not always fine <laughs> with this, uh, which is, uh, I mean, online learning is more active. It's more uh, difficult. We have this distance created by the, sc the screen. Cognitively, we know it's more exhausting. It's more, uh, it's more difficult to stay motivated, not get distracted. I mean, there's a million distracted just a, distractions just a click away. Um, uh, we also know that retention rates are lower when we're working online. Uh, so we need to adapt to this. So which is why we usually recommend more, maybe shorter, but more regular sessions. Definitely maybe uh, 30 to 45 minutes is, is usually a good average or just, you know, a close task, something they can finish and then they feel good about it and move on to the next one or then do something else for a bit and come back maybe the day after, two days later. So more regular sessions. Again, we have loads of more input. We have more frequency of input, which is always a good thing. It allows for flexibility because it's easier to find half an hour in a day rather than a two hour block. Then again, it's more likely to actually do it. And then, of course, in shorter blocks, we have more motivation increased concentration and through that, obviously, um, higher retention rates as well. Um, and then, of course, in order for it to work, and I'll repeat it again and again, is really connecting this to the face-to-face -face course. So if you're working online, we need they need to see the point of it and we need to build on this um, in the next face-to-face -face session uh, somehow. It can be a, a short quiz, it can be an activity, we can build on the resource we've seen, they can mobilize the vocabulary they've seen, but we really need to show them what that it's important to do this online part. And then this, auto, uh, this, this autonomous online learning part as well is a good uh, occurrence uh, for a uh, good opportunity for personalization, but also remediation and differentiation that way, and that we can mix um, resources and, and activities as well. We can give them a choice. Um, so that is one option I've, I've I've learned to use is not to give them just compulsory activities. Um, so obviously we have compulsory activities that need to be done online. Um, we need them because it's part of the course and we need this part to be done, for example, for, to prepare the assessment and have some common ground for assessment. That is important. Compulsory activities are, of course, part of it. And um, as long as they're clearly communicated to the students and they know what to do, when to do it. It's perfectly fine. But what I've learned, what really works for online learning as well, and it's maybe slightly di more difficult to connect to the face-to-face -face learning, but then again, they see that it's, it's more free, so they're more motivated about it and it brings more intrinsic motivation, is really these optional activities. So that can be um, where you have topics or themes on several levels, for example, or you give them the choice between I don't know, two, three articles to read or um, choose an article and write a summary about it. Um, if we have this kind of, of personalization, we can just give them a choice between two or three articles, not too much choice, otherwise they're going to be overwhelmed and postponing it and then procrastinating it potentially. But if they just have the choice, they have this 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 impression of choice. We still choose our, our relevant resources, but they have this choice and they can make their own you know, take their own learning into their own hands, which is very motivating as well. And again, it makes it more likely for learners to actually do this. Then we have some more personalized content, content and maybe independent work. There, and that, that is really something that really works for learners as well. Um, so that is, um, again, slightly more difficult to connect then. You can have them work in, in subgroups, for example, all the learners who've worked on one, I don't know, for example, we've uh, opted for three different news texts and uh, news articles and then we have uh, one group of three different groups of learners in the next class just working on it briefly exchanging about it just to build on this activity it's just one suggestion of how we could link this to the to the face-to-face -face, uh, sessions um so this these so really a good mix of compulsory and optional activities of free of choice activities is usually a good option as well to motivate learners to connect our two parts as well 
Then in class, um, for the face-to-face, -face, the synchronous part of the class, um, of course, it's important to check in on online materials. This is that connecting, uh, this linking way. So usually we have in platforms, we have uh, reporting tools where we can check in on the learners. I know we don't know, we're, we're always short in time, right? We don't have enough time to check in on every individual learner and check in, okay, has he done this exercise? Have they done this? Have they done that? We don't have the time to do that, but at least we can check in whether if they've logged in over the past week when they were supposed to do, for example, activities. Uh, and then we can also connect in class, just see, okay, have you done the activities? If we do this linking activity, we can see straight away. Okay, have they done it? Haven't they done it? Why haven't they done it? And then also it's kind of, you know, they 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 see that it's important and might maybe come unprepared once, but then the next time they see that, well, it's going to be not, noted and uh, if they if they come unprepared and they can um, uh, and they will hopefully come prepared the next times. Um, and then, of course, uh, we check understanding, need for clarification. That is a good opportunity as well to connect, is go more in depth and build on what we've seen online. Um, and then, of course, then we have more time. Again, if it's part in line with your class objectives, uh, we have time to focus on more interactive activity, on peer learning and oral production, all these tasks for which we don't usually have enough time. Now, to summarize maybe to finish this uh this talk quickly i want to share some lessons i've learned um during the uh, during my courses um maybe after the first round i wasn't entirely convinced uh of of this blended learning approach and uh, so I've, I've repeated this course several times and i've learned every time really and how what we what, what can do better i mean there's one thing between the theory you have the theory you know what you're supposed to do but then what works for you what works for your learners and really um I have really learned that, and I've mentioned it, we never have enough time, but we need to allow for some time to explain and listen to the learners. So that means that beyond just the course modalities, of course, we always explain how the course works, how they will be evaluated at the end, but um, really taking the time to explain how the course works, not just, okay, this is the course, this is your resources, um, this is what you're supposed to do, um, but really, okay, why did we opt for a blended course? What is this approach? Why are we doing this? Um, how are we going to do this? Um, just explaining the base, not in every detail, but just the basics for them. And then also the tools, really not, not just considering that they're digital natives, they'll be fine. No, they're not. We actually need to go log in with them and, and help them. I've had learners, they... I don't know. They lost the, the 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 login email to the to the to the platform. Then it became a huge thing in their head, and it became just just this massive block, this mental block before they could log in. And in the end, it was panic two weeks before the exam because they were supposed to work to do a number of activities, and they couldn't because there was this mental block about going online to this platform and and doing it. So it became this massive thing, and and there were two or three students the first time. So the next year, I really went online with them, showed them where to go, how to create um, their profile and everything, and that really just avoided this. And once they were online again, and they they could go back in again and do the activities. So um, I will never assume that they're native digital natives anymore, but I'll just really just help with the, help them log in and go in and show them around the platform as well. Um, of course, talking about how they will be, be evaluated is important. That's the first question usually students ask, at least my students usually do. Uh, is, will this be part of the exam, ma'am? Um, that is definitely a typical question, but then also show that not just the face-to-face -face part is important for the exam, but also the online part and include this in your in your um, evaluation as well. And then, of course, allow learners to ask questions, but also to give feedback about the activities, um, about the approach as well. Um, they felt a lot more involved once I'd explained the approach to them and uh, gave them some time to discuss the activities we've done. And sometimes I just learned from them, okay, no, this this was a, uh, that was a no, no, that didn't work. And it allowed me to to go over this and to 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 reevaluate that activity for the for the year after and 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 get it maybe right or at least uh, slightly better uh, through that input. So not only does the the students learned a lot, but I actually learned a lot as well from them uh, through this direct feedback. It took a lot of time that year to to really trial and error, but it's really something where I noticed that the learners were a lot more engaged and super super engaged and active in the course and they really learned a lot and their grades were phenomenal at the end of the class so i was very happy with that all right 
that's it for my presentation.